This guitar, as you can see from its blood splash graphic works, is meant to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to melt your face off. And this is also meant to do one thing and one thing well. That is to go fast and melt your face off. So does it go fast? Stick around and let's find out together. Roll the intro. Hello everyone, how are you? This is your Shirley Diabetic Cycling coming at you once again. If you are a regular who's a subscriber, welcome back. If you are new to this channel and if this is your very first video, where have you been? I've been missing you. Hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so I can come see you more often. This is a channel brought to you by and sponsored by none other than my own damn wallet. I do not have to return any press demo bikes after one short ride. I don't own a dying paper magazine business where I have to chase advertise money for in fear of pissing them off by saying the wrong things. I don't own a bike shop to sell you anything. I'm definitely not a douchey social media influencer that needs to steer you one way or another with an agenda. I am as unbiased and straightforward, transparent as one can be. Just a regular normal guy you're gonna see on a weekend club ride. Half of you ain't able to smoke me and the other half of you, I'll probably be able to smoke you. Over the last couple dozen years, I've been lucky enough to own and ride a hell out of a couple dozen bikes, which I'll list right here which those bikes are listed for the reason of establishing a baseline, what this video review will be based upon. So in this review episode, I'll be going over Ribble Ultra SLR in depth, including negatives, and you need to stick around because there are some negatives that you should be aware of if you are in the market to buy one of these bikes. As always, I'm not here to say that my uh, thoughts and opinions are right and that yours are wrong or the other way around. This is uh, just one man's opinion and thoughts, so take that for what it's worth. Hopefully, I can add some value to your decision-making process if you are in the market for this bike right now in 2023 or some years later down the road as a second-hand used bike. First and foremost, let's talk Aero. So, I really feel like we are 
in 2023 that we're living in the golden age of cycling and you know bikes that are available to us and i say that because just some years ago the type of, of bikes that were available to us normal consumers i mean they were nice bikes but we have come a long way i mean we have the things like the full wireless shifting drivetrain like the SRAM Access, great shifting and semi-wireless like the DI2 stuff. We got hookless rims, which if you told me my wheels would be 10 years later hookless where the beads are sitting against just a flat surface, I would have told you, you are absolutely out of your mind. Power meters are affordable. That's, I mean, so many things that I could, the, the list could go on and on where I would be able to really validate my claim that we are living in the golden age of cycling. So the aero bikes for the pros exist for obvious reasons. Pros need to go fast, they need to win races, that's literally their job. And that's how they support their family, the prize money, the contract, lucrative contract. Literally, that's how they make their living. So they need to go fast. But what about for mere mortals like myself and some of you, where we are not racing to support our family. This is not our livelihood. So why does why do bikes like this exist? Just because I I'll tell you something. I have no business owning a bike that's like this because I'm just a hobby rider enthusiast level, of course. But I mean, do I really need to fight for that marginal gain uh, from bikes such as this, where I'm like clawing for like every second to every stop sign, you know, town sign that my me and the buddies are sprinting for. That's not what I need the bike for. I'm more really function over form. However, a lot of you, a lot of us really like the looks of aero bikes for their sleek shaping, the design cues and what have you. So that's where I kind of go for even enthusiasts and hobby riders. If you like the way your bike looks, inevitably you're gonna ride that thing a lot more. So if the appearance of the bike is one of the factors that pushes you out the door for you to ride more, I say by all means, more power to you. And I would not put up an argument there. So as I mentioned in my episode 12, Every each year when the bike makers come out with a new model, they make these claims. The new model compared to last year is now X percent stiffer, X percent more compliant. It'll save you X number of watts over X number of miles. X, it's now X percent more aero than compared to last year. So I find that somewhat comical because in one year period of time, you know, computational fluid design process really didn't change that much where it, there would be some groundbreaking changes in terms of a bike design. Maybe it's possible do you have they have access to newer carbon that they didn't have access to last year where it would be so much more stiffer and all that. You know, and the claims like we will the new model saves you one watt over 35 mile per hour average going 40 miles really literally means nothing to a lot of us. And when I say a lot of us, I mean non-professional racers alike. So the reason why I mention that is, you know, every year while we may not see a whole lot of groundbreaking changes, every about 10 years or so, I feel like we see something hugely uh, different that really moves the industry forward. You know, like 10 years ago, we didn't have hookless wheels. Uh, 10 years ago, we didn't have uh, access ETAP. We had ETAP, just wasn't access ETAP. We didn't have 12 speeds. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps uh, tubeless probably wasn't a thing with the road cycling 10 years ago. And so you, you sort of see what I'm saying? Every 10 years or so, we see something monumentally different, even with the bike design. So right now, currently I'm riding Pinarello Prince. I have a Factor Ostro. I have um, Cervelo Soloist. Now I have this Rival Ultra SLR. So most of my bikes, minus the Rival, 
they have all like a aero attributes but they're not like a all out aero full on aero bike so this is my first full on aero bike since the time i owned and ridden uh cervelo s3 that was several years back so that was about 2014 2015 ish when i rode uh that thing around that was a full aero bike i uh, made no apologies for it and thinking about it tube shape of that bike compared to ribble ultra slr full eight years later they're not i i'm noticing the tube shaping isn't very different and yet this is a much different bike compared to my Cervelo S3 all aero bike now that said you know a lot of things really move the design forward and you know things things like a different uh, material that's available uh, different geometry uh, that you know engineers and designers find different things where again in one year time we may not see much difference but in about 10 years or so we something vastly different case in point another huge factor that I uh, want to mention is something called the UCI rule changes right because the bikes that are sold to us are sold to us because the professional teams in tour and and UCI races they have to ride something that's commercially available for people like us to be able to buy so um, UCI governs what the bikes are gonna look like because they have these regulations the bike makers must conform to recently in 2023 the new rules have taken place where now the designers no longer need to be confined by three to one ratio a lot of the bikes up till now must conform to that whereas now in 2023 new rules kicked in where it's now eight to one so next couple of years we're gonna see some fancy designs because the designers are no longer confined to conform to that three to one ratio now it's an eight to one ratio so we may see something much greater in terms of uh tube shaping and something that's very exotic looking and that will make the bike design move advance a lot more forward so in 10 years from now who knows what we're gonna see okay so now let's talk about ultra sl and slr in depth so ribble puts out basically two flavors of ultra there's ultra sl which the frame looks just like mine but it's uh, built with a heavier carbon and ultra sl comes with a semi-normal looking integrated cockpit whereas the slr uh, uses a uh, lighter and stiffer carbon and you get the ultra slr cockpit which i'm going to spend a lot of time on in this video later on so a lot of you regulars may know but i actually don't watch any review videos of a particular bike if it's a bike that i'm actually going to review later on down the road uh, that's because i don't want my thoughts and opinions to be clouded by somebody else's thoughts and opinions that said i did watch the announcement videos when this bike debuted about a year ago uh, various bike magazine uh, youtube channels and what have you so i am aware of uh, i was aware of what the bike was like when i put the order in and one of the interesting things that i picked up at that time was the ceo came on on one of the videos and mentioned the bike was designed not just for the pro riders to go faster but for us normal folks to really eke out extra aero gain and uh, help us in going faster so whether that is true whether I feel that's true or not I'll get back to you on that a little bit later in this episode so stay tuned okay so let's now talk about the buying experience um, see the online configurator and online ordering process is actually very clean it's well executed it's easy to pick and choose how you want your bike to be so that part is great as far as what happens afterwards i have a separate episode which i'll link right here which you could go back and watch but um my experience was uh, pretty tumultuous to say the least so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna chalk it up as 
not positive experience. I won't say it was a negative experience, but I'll say that it was a not positive experience, uh, especially a couple of the times where I was misled by their employees, including the CEO himself, when they were um, asked about the bikes build a state and the possible dispatch date and such um, i was a flat out told lies so that's regardless of how i feel about it what your opinions may be because i presented that episode as you know this is what happened to me take it for what it's worth some of you agreed with me that um i was uh, done wrong some of you disagreed with me citing that i was being hyperbolic and that's okay i wasn't trying to seek out vindication or um validation from that episode. So if you're interested, again, watch uh, what I link uh, in terms of what I'm talking about for not so positive buying experience. Let's talk about the actual bike now. I'm five feet, 10 inches tall, but I'm basically all torso with a somewhat shorter legs for my height. So when I buy bikes, I buy bikes as if I was about five, seven, five, eight. Normally I ride bikes a stack of about 525, reach of about 380. So the bike that I got from Ribble was their size small. And I'm gonna give you some reference point here. Um, on Cannondale, I ride 50 to 52. Canyon, I fall extra small to small. Um, my Pinarello is 51 and a half. My Factor Austro is uh, 52. My Orbea was 51. My BMC was 51. And for giant bikes, I ride the small. So that's gonna give you some level of uh, reference. A lot of you guys ask how tall I am for bike sizing, but height is height should get you into a zip code of where you should be. Height shouldn't give you the exact address of where you're going. So, you know, don't worry about the height so much. It's actually the stack and the reach numbers that should come handy. So a lot of you, if you're gonna ask me how tall I am, Speaking of the uh, stack and reach, this bike in size small came with a stack of a 523 and reach of a 385. So it's just so dead on perfect for the uh, dimensions and proportions that I'm looking for in my bike sizing. When the bike debuted, it made a splash with this just spectacularly different looking cockpit all integrated bar so i'm gonna spend a lot of time on that later when we get to that portion of it so the bar that i ordered was um 40 so when you order 40 you're gonna get 40 from drop to drop at the hood you're gonna get 36 so um it's very narrow as so so my bike was built with Altegra Di2 12 speed. I'm running 5034 chain setup at the front, 1134 cassette in the back. My rotors are 160 front and 160 rear. Now that said, when I changed the wheels out to current uh, wheels that I'm riding, I did change the rotors and the cassette to Dura Ace against my better judgment. And I say against my better judgment because Dura Ace cassette wears out quicker than Altegra and the Dura Ace rotors are not any lighter than the Altegra rotors. In terms of saddle, factory spec saddle is this uh, Sele Telia SLR Boost, which actually is a current modern day favorite saddle. Um, I actually do happen to like the Superflow version, which has the center cut out uh, right here in the center channel and the rails would be carbon. And that's actually what I'm riding currently on the Ribble Ultra SLR. Okay, so the factory spec, the wheels were DB56. Their in-house brand level makes these wheels. And if you were to buy those wheels separately, they uh, the suggested retail price on those were 1,100 euros, but they are on sale right now for 450 euros. And they still make money when they sell them at that price. So imagine the profit margin on there. Um, now, the factory wheels DB56, I'm gonna spend a little bit more about that in the uh, ride later on, ride section of the review. But despite wearing 
Continental Grand Prix 5000 tires that were 28 mil wide, internal width must be very narrow because the tires didn't come out you know, as wide as it should be with the 28 mil tires. If you want more detail of how the bike actually arrived, please refer to my unboxing video, which I will link right here. Okay, now the design and aesthetics of this bike. So some bikes just look fast when they are just standing still, right? I would classify this bike as being one of those. It just looks deadly while standing still. Head tube section is absolutely massive with this uh, fairing like situation that happens on the sides as, it, as the head tube tapers off to connect to the down tube and the top tube. And uh, basically it is molded and shaped that way to uh, aid the airflow to create less turbulence. The C-tube has this uh, very elegant cutout following the outline of a wheel. So the rear wheel is brought towards the center of the bike a bit and it creates a very smooth um, transition from the C-tube to the wheel, create, uh, creating uh, less turbulence for the air to travel. The down tube also has a similar design cue uh, uh, where the, the top section of the down tube has a slight cutout for the front wheel to again come back, move back a bit towards the center of the bike, which creates a very aggressive um, stance because your wheelbase is somewhat um, shorter and um, it also creates a smoother transition of the airflow from the wheel, the tire combination. The fork has a typical blade design that is uh, almost synonymous with the aero bike. So it, it looks very wide to aid, again, to aid the air to flow a certain way. But if you look at it from the, if you look at the fork from the front, they're not very skinny. And also the fork has very uh, wide shoulders, which uh, you could think, hey, that looks like I could put on 33 mil tires on there and go gravel riding. No, you might be able to fit uh, wider tires on there, but this bike is meant for gravel. The bottom bracket section is absolutely massive. It is probably the biggest bottom bracket section I've ever seen on mass produced consumer road bike. The seat post is a uh, you know, pretty typical aero affair, uh, slender from the front and a very uh, blade looking like design if you look at it from the side. So the seat stays and the chain stays, unlike modern bikes, what uh, they are, they are symmetric. Um, a lot of the bikes such as my Pinarello uh, has asymmetric design. In the old days, the power drive side had a thicker tube. Nowadays, a lot of companies put thicker tubing on the brake side because of the torque that's generated by disc brakes. But this bike has symmetric design. What seems odd, however, is with the exception of the bottom part of the down tube, rest of the tubing isn't using overly pronounced the cam tail truncated foil design that is very common with aero bikes of today. As you see from my bike, it you know it is wearing a team continental team a weld tights a paint theme, which is uh, what the bike was ordered with at the time. You know, however, during the time when I ordered and during the time when I received the bike, in between the team has gone defunct, so the paint job that the bike is wearing is no longer relevant. Um, however, fast forward to today, if you were to order your Ribble Ultra today, I do see they have a lot of other uh, paint themes and colors available. At the time, I picked this design, not because I was a fan or anything, I know nothing about this team, but based on the colors and themes that were available, this was the most attractive to me, and that's why I got this uh, paint theme, which I'm regretting a bit, because again, it's, I'm, I'm riding around on a bike that's wearing a paint theme that is not valid. Speaking of the paint, paint job is absolutely gorgeous. It's one of the better paint jobs I've ever seen, especially that integrated cockpit. It is like, automotive quality, like a fancy exotic car type of a paint job. 
very, very pl uh, pleased with that. But also what comes with that kind of a paint job, uh, what I noticed is a paint job is very, very thin. So the coats are thin and that's probably by design not to add any additional weight to the bike. But the thin paint job also means that anything hitting your frame, most likely you will end up with a paint chip. I touched on the tire clearance earlier a bit, but at the front you have a ton of tire clearance, especially at the front, the fork is a uh, fork shoulder very wide and ton of room in there if you were to put on something thicker. In the rear, however, you do have a ton of space in between the C stays. But that's not where the uh, issue would be if you were to put on something thicker in terms of the tires because where the uh, chain stays meet the bottom bracket section, that's where you have very little tolerance in terms of anything larger to go in. Currently, I'm running NV29 mils on the rear and which end up about 30 mil. And with that, I'm I have comfortable enough clearance, but I wouldn't go any wider than that. Also, if you go any wider than this on the road bike, you are now playing in the territory of not being so aero. You're negating the benefits you would get from aero. So that's how I'm running it. And just for reference, at the front, I'm running NV27s. And the last point for design and aesthetics, it is clearly and obviously designed for a professional racer that needs to go fast, who can also put out a ton of power because the power transfer is absolutely ridiculous. And it's also probably for someone that is flexible. So when I first saw the announcement of this bike with that handlebar, they were making all this claim of how the bar is designed to deflect and uh, create all this uh, turbulence for air so that you are aero and all these aero claims were made on the bar. I was skeptical back then. Um, today, I'm not here to either validate those claims or debunk those claims. I'm neither. I don't buy integrated handle, I don't buy aero handlebars for aero benefits. A lot of irregulars may have heard me say this before. I buy aero bars because I find those more comfortable than even the round ergo bars, right? Because I prefer all that flat surface up at the top and I rest my hands there and I just find them comfortable. Like if I'm climbing, I, I'm at the top and it feels great. And aero bars have a way of, you know, connecting the junction over to the hood and I feel, you know, those being comfortable. So, Along that, all, you know, along with that is I can't mess up the orientation of the handlebar. With the typical stem and bar combination, you have to worry about the bar's orientation so you're not, your, your shifters are not pointing up or pointing down and your bar is dead center instead of a little to the left, a little to the right uh, when you have the stem. When I buy integrated aero handlebar, I'm comfortable. I don't have to worry about the alignment, great. So this bar is muscular for lack of better explanation. It has bulges, it has these uh, lines and the curves and I mean it is humongous. There's a lot of carbon in this handlebar. The top section has the widest surface area of any handlebar you've ever seen on a road bike. The section from the top to the, where the hoods uh, go has this beefy, beefy section where you can rest your hand. There's a lot to hold on to. So what it allows is creates all these different hand positions that you probably don't have on typical handlebars. I just find a lot of different positions where I could put my hands and I feel so comfortable. And I love that about this handlebar. With the Black Ink Factor handlebar and Pinarello handlebar, what I also like about those were how, like, they have this oval shaping at the drops and they have this variable thickness and they're very svelte. And I really loved grabbing those bars because um, they feel like I'm holding on to nothing. I really love how light they feel, right? 
This thing is the exact opposite. It is big, it is huge, it's muscular. There's a lot there. It's a polar opposite of those other handlebars that I've mentioned. However, I love this thing so much because there's so much uh, surface area and different hand positions that it allows. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through the hand positions and show you what I'm talking about. So the shifters, they are inward and Basically, the bar is designed for that position and that position only. And I'm gonna show you uh, the, the buildings, inner workings of it. So right now I got the whole Euro trash, <laughs> uh, the shifter position going inward. Now that's also with the shifter angles kind of going this way, flaring out towards the bottom. So when you have your hand right in this position, it's very natural. There's no weird angle of your wrist bending weird way or anything like that. So it's a very natural position. It feels great in here. All right, so when you look at this shifter, so you are familiar with the way shifter hoods go, right? So when I peel the shifter bag, you, what you get is this plastic gasket fitting looking thing. So what that is doing is the way the bar is shaped here with the direct mount shifters, there's this bit of a gap as the uh, bar is shaped. So this rubber piece is a somewhat loose form fitting. So it's gonna sit as so and then you're gonna peel your hood back. Basically, your hood is what secures that rubber fitting gasket in its, in its place. Now here's what the problem is though. If you have your shifter positioned high, like a pointing upwards or pointing even more inside, what's gonna happen is that fitting is gonna be like this. It's just gonna, it's, just gonna sit there and just flap around a bit. So in order for that to sit properly, you need to ha again have your shifter in a proper spot and then have it in the correct spot where the rubber of the hood will sit against it, keeping it in its place. So that's why there's basically only one correct spot for your shifter where, where Rivel designers engineered it to be. Because if the shifter sits at the traditional way, then you're gonna have the top piece of the rubber piece all showing. So basically you use that as a guide to um, have your shifter to sit at the correct angle. So when you're in the tuck and you're head down and you're just going and you're just motoring, right? Your forearm has, your forearms have this very wide surface area to rest on, creating stability, even though you are, you know, in my case, it's a 36 uh, centimeter hood to, hood to hood. So it's narrower than my typical liking, but it's a stable because I'm resting my hands there, I'm comfortable, and there's a support on my forearm, so I'm not hurting as much in my tricep area. So just unexpectedly great, I found. Furthermore, when I was buying this, I was really skeptical about in terms of a stability and such because at the hood 36, that's a little tighter than I would have liked. Previously, the narrowest I've ridden was a 39 on my Canyon Ultimate. But I tell you what, 36 felt great. Not, you know, and I'm not talking about, yes, I mean, the position does put you in like a full tuck aero mode, which I found great. But I don't, I really didn't find the width at the hoods to become problematic, even at much narrower spacing. Now, consequently, at the drops, there are 40, which is what, my, what I normally ride, but all of a sudden, that feels way too wide. So the mines will definitely play some tricks on you. So that's something that I wanna share with you uh, now. now it's to a point where my future purchases, I'm pondering whether I should just order 36 or 38 just universal from now on because uh, you know 36 definitely put me in a spot where I liked. 
and you know I'm not gonna go crazy like that one other youtuber that went 33 that's a little too extreme but I think that, that I've, I've, I have found the narrow at the top and the uh, flared out at the bottom 36 and 40 to work great for my liking all right so how does she ride let's talk about that so this bike is a quintessential example of why i hesitate matter of fact why i never review bikes after one ride because if i had to review this bike after just one ride my review would have been vastly different compared to how i feel about the bike after several hundred miles on it okay so two things i need to point out one bike is extremely stiff two the bike has a lot of carbon fiber on it before i took the bike out for the first ride i sort of had this um, preconceived notion that my ride would be hostile i thought the bike would feel harsh i felt like i was gonna get beaten down after the ride uh, my first ride was about 75 miles on it and i remember coming off that ride thinking oh my god all my thoughts were right this thing is hard it's harsh um it's i i feel beaten up and so i was thinking so all the thoughts that i had previously are true that's what I thought at the time. However, that turned out to be just my thoughts playing tricks with my head. And you know, my, your mind will do a lot of funky things for you. So the bike, despite its uh, build characteristics, it's a stiff, it's got a ton of carbon, it's aero. I'm gonna say the word, it's actually pretty comfortable to ride. I've been on several rides that are six hours plus, 100 miles plus. Never ca I came off those rides, except for the very first day. Never came I came off the rides thinking, boy, I am beaten down. The bike is beating me up. I've never felt that. Make no mistake about it. The seat post is as stiff as teenage boys, you know what. There is no give in that seat post. However, rest of the bike, absolutely superb in terms of somehow creating compliance when it's so dang stiff. On the rear side, uh, probably aided by my tubeless setup running 29 mil, that's almost 30. At the front end, I don't know if all this carbon and the way this bar is designed, I don't know if that's absorbing all that um, vibration for me, but boy, I tell you what, I, I, don't, I feel pretty fresh when I come off those rides and I'm here to tell you, despite aero bikes having that preconceived notion aforementioned, even myself, this one doesn't feel like it's really beating me up that badly. Now, admittedly, I did switch the wheels from the factory DB56 wheels to Zip 404 Firecrest wheels. The factory DB56 wheels were actually fast. They were very aero, and once you got to once you got going and there were plenty of speed on those wheels they do weigh 1670 grams and so they're a little bit on the heavy side although for at 56 maybe they're not too heavy but the problem was despite they were aero and fast to get from zero to fast it took a you know a little bit more extra effort than what i would have liked hence i ended up swapping the wheels out also like i mentioned earlier the wheels had this profile where even with the 28 mil tires they felt a little narrow now i'm not going to talk too much about the zip 404 firecrest on this bike because that's not the standard factory spec so going back to the db56 wheels um like I told you earlier, they were on sale, and I also told you about my buying experience at Ribble. There was a lot of chatter on the internet about Ribble's stability as a company, and I forget where I saw it, but like back in January, they failed to file some corporate governance or something, so they were at the brink of a liquid being liquidated, and I believe they're okay now, because they made some financial uh, commitment they met that commitment they had to make to stay afloat so 
I, you know, there were some talks of, you know, are they having all this sale? Are they selling at, you know, fire sale because of um, possibility of being liquidated? I don't know. I, uh, that's not something that I know for sure. Please go do your own research if that's something you're interested in. But that's uh, something to uh, think about. Some of you may be wondering, okay, it's arrow, but how does it climb? Well, I'm going to tell you this. If, uh, if I'm going out on a ride and if I'm climbing up to about 6,000, 7,000 feet, I have zero problem taking out this bike with the Zip 404 Firecrest on it. Uh, with the factory wheels, I'm probably not going to do that because they were pr you, you felt the weight as you're rotating. Um, despite the weight difference only being 160 grams from the factory wheels to my Zip 404, um, it was pretty noticeable. And also up to certain speed, even when you're climbing, aero does come into play. So I don't know if that's really aiding in what my feedback uh, is here, but really I don't feel like I'm suffering on uh, climbing, uh, when, when I'm climbing on this bike. Just to be transparent though, if, I'm, if my day's ride is gonna be more than 7,000 feet climbing, then I'll probably take a different bike. So the general chassis of the bike is that of a pure racing bike. It has a shorter wheelbase, um, so basically it's a three centimeters shorter than my BMC Road Machine and about two centimeters shorter than most of my other bikes. The handling is crisp, urgent, snappy, and precise. There is no lazy fork rake that uh, found on like uh, some endurance bikes like my PMC Road Machine. The bike doesn't ride like a relaxed limo, it actually rides like a very angry Austin Martin DBS. The way the cockpit invites you into that aero, aggressive aero position, the bike definitely moves with a purpose. I'm really just a general nobody. Again, I have no business of uh, going fast, right? But that all said, the bike is really like eager to move forward, propel forward, and as evident, uh, as evidently visible in the bottom bracket section, the power transfer is ridiculous. There is absolutely nothing being lost between the engine yourself and the bike. A downhill descent, forget about it. The bike will get you go faster than everybody else while they're pedaling and you can take that to bank. Climbing or not, aero or not, this is a super fun bike that gives you this sensation of going fast, which all us roadies can appreciate and that is completely abundantly clear. So the stiffest bike I've ever ridden so far uh, has been the Merck's San Remo 76, cause that thing has a zero give. That was a stiff bike. This bike, however, is just as stiff, if not stiffer. It's very, 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 very stiff. Have I told you it's a stiff? Here's something I thought about while I was riding this bike. So you know those uh, triathlon events where they run, swim, and bike and all that. So triathlon bikes, you know, they have, cause they're not regulated by UCI, unlike time trials. So, so tri bikes, they have this all fancy design, like the Cervelo P5X, S-Works Shiv, Canyon Speed Max. They have all this just designed with the purpose of going fast, right? And what if you are a roadie occasionally dabbling in triathlon or vice versa and you only want to have one bike? I could totally see you having just this bike, use it as your road bike as well as your time trial, I'm sorry, triathlon event bike because it's massively aero. It will go fast, down, flat, what have you. Throw on a deeper section wheel, like right now I have 58 up at the front and 58 on the back. I would say maybe 58 at the front and maybe something like a 67, uh, even 80 in the rear for those triathlon events and I think you would be dialed perfect. 
Because of the way the handlebar is shaped, you can't really throw on a clip-on handlebar there, obviously. But because of the way the bar forces you into this tuck position, now with your typical triathlon clip-on bars, you're going to be this position right here. But this handlebar will at least give you something like this, where you're you're not all aerial like a triathlon is needed, but you're pretty close. Let's talk about the negatives. As is with a lot of the bikes in aero uh, sector, there is a bit of a front toe overlap. All right, so one of the things I forgot to mention as I recorded my main role here as a negative is just as you had the toe overlap, you also have a problem with your heel striking one of the chain stays depending on your shoe size and possibly your pedaling style. I actually tend to pedal with the toes in and heels out kind of thing. Uh, so normally I wouldn't actually hit that uh, chain stay because my heels actually pointing outwards normally and I also wear uh, shoe size 43 now chain stay stays at size 410 millimeter regardless even if you go up in size in frame so your chain stays at a fixed length no matter what size you get now if I am actually hitting with my heel uh, the chain stay on the right hand side and left hand side uh, if I'm not like a cognizantly like avoiding uh, while I'm pedaling so uh, that could be a factor and I would throw this into negative because uh, it, you know it's lacking in flexibility. Again, the handlebar basically has one proper position for your shifters. So uh, if you prefer having your shifters like this, or if you don't want that Euro tuck as such, you want to have your shifters like a standard way. Um, that flexibility isn't there. And also, I showed you earlier how that up. Uh, you know rubber gasket flaps around if you don't have it just right stuff like that um so i will chalk that up as a negative uh secondly another negative would be the ribble bottle cages that i received despite they're ridiculously light the tension isn't quite there the way the bottles sit they're not snug um, i haven't lost a bottle my bottles haven't popped out yet but the friction isn't just there to securely hold the uh, bottles, I feel like. So the bottle cages could use a slightly more, um, slightly more tension for lack of better terms. And this is a PSA more than a negative, but both the SRAM and Shimano commented on the way Ribble is a direct mounting their shifters because uh, they do without the clamps. Ribble will send you the unused clamps so um, both, both the SRAM and Shimano uh, said that they don't recommend this way of doing it, safety concern. I, after a bunch of miles that I've ridden, I personally don't think it's a problem. Um, it's pretty solid. I'm not really worried about it. So again, not necessarily a negative, but public service announcement. Now you know. Final bit in negative is when the bike was delivered, and I, you know, I showed a little bit in the unboxing. Again, I, I, I would link that video if you want to watch it. The bike came with a ton of grease. I mean, mechanic and the bike who, the guy who packed it, really didn't pay much attention to meticulously cleaning the bike before being packed. The saddle came with ton of grease on it. Looked disgusting. Top tube, down tube. I mean, even the bits that shouldn't have grease because it, the the particular part actually relies on friction. I mean, they have grease everywhere. I guess the the one good thing was that the grease they used seemed like a really good quality grease, at least. But the bike came super greasy everywhere. They didn't even you know bother to wipe it down. That bothered me a bit. Again, not a showstopper, but. I felt like I'm mentioning. I felt like I should mention that. In conclusion, the first bit I want to talk about is okay. The company that makes this bike, they have issues, especially the upper management, and I don't really care for that. However, the bike that they produce, this bike in particular, because this is the one I own, it's solid. 
Yes, it has some negative bits just like I shared with you earlier, but I really like this bike. It's solid. Secondly, the bike came really nearly assembled. I mean, it literally took me not that many minutes to put the cockpit on and put the saddle and do some fine adjustments to really get out, get it out on the road. So, I mean, even the rotors were perfectly aligned. My indexing was perfectly, my gears were perfectly indexed. So great experience in terms of uh, delivery and unpacking and minor assembly to get going. Thirdly, if you're in the business of going fast and you will not settle for anything less, you couldn't do wrong with this bike. So with my setup, mostly Ultegra with uh, you know tiny bits of a Dura Ace thrown in there, Zip 404 Firecrest at 1500 grams, uh, the computer mount, bottle cage, two bottle cages, and my pedal on pe my pedals on board. Bike weighs 19 pounds about 8.6 kilo so to you weight weenies that's not a light bike by any stretch of imagination but in conclusion i'm gonna tell you what like i said earlier with the right characteristics i don't really pay attention to weight that much it's about how the bike feels under and i'm really not feeling i'm suffering if I, when i'm on a spicy climb whether i'm climbing that alone against my own or with homies it just feels snappy and i'm not suffering at all but again if i'm having a massive climbing day like for instance if i'm gonna go back to mauna loa i'm not taking this bike but up to about 7,000 feet or so in one ride i don't have any problems taking this bike so do I really feel faster on this bike? I'll tell you this. I feel fast when, I, when I'm on this bike because it just hums and it just motors. Um, you know, you could look at your segment records, your PRs and PBs, but there are variables there, wind conditions and road conditions, how dense the air is. So I don't really look at that as barometer to measure my effort. And also I'm older, so if I set my PB eight years ago on a bike, I mean, it's unfair for me to compare myself to my younger self, and that was before my accident. So, you know, I don't really, I, I can't use that as an example, but I'm gonna tell you this as a real life example. There is a homie that I ride with often. He and I are about the same level. Some days he goes faster, some days I go faster. He and I were taking turns in a pace line. We're pulling and I'm at the front for very long duration, 20 minutes, whatever, up at the front while he's benefiting drafting behind me. Again, we're at about the same level. I'm really not noticing I'm working hard. I can see my power output on my computer, but I, I mean, I could see my speed and I could see my power up, but I'm going, I'm really not putting that much effort. Meanwhile, I can hear my homie whom I normally wouldn't hear this. Maybe I felt better that day. Maybe he felt worse that day. Who knows? However, I'm hearing him in the back panting to keep up with me who's pulling in the front. So is that arrow gains? Is that arrow benefits? Possibly. So I feel faster. Isn't that all that matters? So I feel like Aero has come a long way, really. I mean, the whole Cervelo redefined the genre many years ago. Then you had your Solo S, then you had your Cervelo S series. And this is just a epitome of Aero bikes within the regulations. And I feel like I'm just cheating when I'm riding this bike. And yet it's really surprisingly easy to get along with. And the overhead of uh, riding on the aero bike just doesn't seem to be here anymore. Cause it used to be hard and heavy and all those things. Yes, it's still heavy, but I just really don't feel that's getting in the way. So to conclude this video, I'm gonna give you a douchey assessment, douchey saying. Um, you don't want your bike to 
fight with you. You want bike to sort of be seamless and kind of a disappear because you and the bike being one and your pedal strokes really translate to power transfer and the bike receiving that input and outputs that into the forward propelling motion. I really feel like as, whenever I'm hopping on this bike, I just feel like there's this like a synergy between me and the bike. Oh, how douchey does that sound? But uh, um, that synergy, synergetic relationship between me and the bike, I just feel that the bike doesn't fight me back. Uh, where we're like this finely tuned, you know, one between the bike and I, and I just feel I I, I hold that very high, because, you know, I I don't have to worry about anything with this bike. It puts me in the right position. It transfers power well. It feels comfortable, surprisingly. So easy to get along with. Really, nothing more to complain about. Okay. I had a lot to say in this episode. Thank you for sticking around. I appreciate your time hanging out with me. Um, so that's it for this episode. Until next time, you guys have been awesome. I've been Diabetic Cycling. Keep the rubber side down. Be safe out there. Diabetic Cycling out. <laughs>